Aerith. Before we break out of here, talk to us. There's so much we don't know. I'm a descendant of the ancients. That's pretty much it, really. Hmm. Oh, but just so you know, that's not their actual name. They called themselves the Cetra. Hmm. We who were born of the planet, with her we speak, her flesh we shape. Unto her promised land shall we one day return. Yeah, Jack, I agree. By her loving grace and providence, may we take our place in paradise. Mm. You know it. Yeah, well, honestly, I thought that part was just a fairy tale. Mm. Shinra thinks it's true. <laughs> They've been searching for the promised land for a long time. And they must think you can lead them to it. Can you? Hmm. Nope. Someday, maybe I'll find it in me. Part but three, now, baby. Not even if I wanted to. I think to. she will. Even if you could, that land belongs to the. I mean, to you and your people. Shinra's after it because they believe it's rich in Mako. Mako, they've got no right to claim. But they'll try to take it anyway, won't they? <clears throat> Greedy bastards will never stop. Hmm. Okay, new plan. Y'all take Aerith and get the hell out of here. Me, I'm gonna go bust some Shinra heads. Mm. Barrett, wait. You can't do that. <gasps> oh, great. These assholes again. Probably some Shinra science experiment. Whispers. Perhaps best described as arbiters of fate. They are drawn to those who attempt to alter destiny's mm. course and ensure they do not. Like capital D? Destiny? You hear that? They are the governance the flow of the, great of the life river stream. That is the planet from inception to oblivion. And you're saying that that flow is somehow fixed? Predestination. Yes. For it is the will of the planet itself. So if we're destined ah, for a bleak amazing. future, these whispers will try to keep us on that course? Yep. Now wait just a damn minute. How in the hell can you possibly know any of that? Spouting that cryptic stuff, which could all be bullshit. I mean, fair. I mean, ain't you a Shinra lab rat or dog? I'm not a rat dog. <laughs> I'm not a when rat Aerith dog. reached out to me, I found this knowledge of the whispers. Ah, you guys, this part. Listen to me. Please. Eric. Y'all, this moment, here, listen to this. This is big. The Shinra Electric Power Company isn't the real enemy. It started with them, sure. But I promise you, there's a much bigger threat. Hmm. I just want to do everything in my power. God, to yes. All of you and the planet. Aerith, what are you not telling us? I'm lost in a maze, and every step is taking me further from the path. Every time the whispers touch me, I lose something, a part of myself. Oh. Chat, can we just chat for just a second before we continue with this scene? Oh my gosh, so Aerith here, I, I mentioned this in my first video about what, why the whispers make sense, but this is the scene, right? This is the scene. First time I saw it, I was like recalling all of my old education on Calvinistic doctrine, on predestination, on faith, on, um, on all of these ideas of devotion in religiosity. And like it, what, what it did for me was Aerith here, 
is having a crisis of belief where she is trusting in the will of the planet. She has been this I, th this person that is an icon, a steward of the planet's will. And for the first time, she's realizing here that something's wrong. And it's not just Shinra, it's bigger than Shinra. It's something that is manipulating the flow of the planet itself. While Shinra is manufacturing this and selling it as a source of energy, Sephiroth is doing something worse. He's stopping the cycle of souls. And this is stopping the actual flow and life cycle of the planet. And she's feeling compelled to do something. And yet for all of her life, because of a, 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 she is a Setra, she has an unflinching devotion to the life stream's will. A steward of the planet, she trusts in what the whispers are doing, and yet something is off, and she can't quite put her finger on it yet. Every step she takes is taking her further from her path, her predestined path. Every day in my life, I work with 18 to 25 year olds. 18 to 25 year olds who have no idea what they're doing with their lives. They come into college and many of them have an idea of what their life is going to look like at 25, at 30, at 40, at 50, whatever it is. And then something happens. They experience new knowledge or cognitive dissonance or life happens and they get shifted off course and suddenly they begin to say things like Aerith is saying. Things like, every step I'm taking is taking me further from the path. And they begin to wonder, who am I? They have a crisis of identity. And that same thing is happening with Aerith here. And what we're going to see in this chapter and in the next is her finding her own resolve and saying, no, everything is not dictated for me. There's a moment where you have to stand up, stand up for yourself, stand up for the things that you believe in, and to go forward in a new path that you are charting, an unknown journey for yourself. And I think that this is a powerful message for us here in chapter six to, uh, 17 at this point about what it's going to mean for Aerith and also for the player. What does it mean in those moments when we feel like our plans in life are going off kilter? It's a great question for us. Let me look at some things here. JV, you say, don't you think the planet is indifferent? Wouldn't trusting the will of the planet be a way of leaving the future of the species to the pragmatism of a being, uh, of a being that seeks only to survive? Yes and no. But if the life stream is an analog to the idea of a divine, the divine, then the idea there is survival. Survival of the planet. I, th I think of it this way. Um, there was an Anglican priest. His name is Leslie Weatherhead. He wrote a book several years ago, I think in the 60s or 70s, and it was called The Will of God. Now, this is Christian in nature, but I think that it applies here. He says when people, specifically Christians, discuss the will of God, they're talking about three specific things. Typically, you're hearing this on bedside confessions and sort of things where people are trying to make sense of things. They're saying things like, um, you know, it's the will of God that this happens. When disasters happen, well, we trust God. We, we just trust in God's will. But Leslie Weatherhead says, well, is it really the will of God for there to be pain in the world, for there to be suffering? This is a deep sort of question, but I love the way that he describes it. He says, when people refer to the will of God, they refer to three aspects of it. The first one is what we call the intentional will of God. This is what God or the divine, whatever religion, um, this is what the will of God is intended for. It intends for people to live well, to live in harmony with God, to live lives that are a blessing to others, love God, love neighbors in Christian traditions. And yet things happen. There's harm in the world. And he allows this, uh, Weatherhead says, that there's the allowance that because God is very interested in free will, so that there's not robots or whatever, that people have agency, that there's what's called the circumstantial will of God. This is a really interesting concept, I think, because the circumstantial will of God allows things to go off course. So instead of like a um, linear bracket, we talk about linear games, um, a linear sort of thing that goes from like the beginning of God's will to the end of God's will, we think of God's will as more like a March Madness basketball tournament. Are you with me? And at every one of those points, 
there's a decision that's made. Now, God has an intention of the way that someone would follow. But what happens when that person makes a wrong decision or something happens that throws them off kilter? Well, God has a, an intentional will in that moment as well. Does that make sense? So there's a circumstantial will of God when the intentional will of God is thwarted. Let me give you a for instance. In 2009, I believe, but I could probably use a more recent event, there was an earthquake in Haiti. There was a lot of death and destruction. Now, a question that was brought up to me as somebody working in religious life was, was that earthquake God's will? And to put it more in these terms, is it God's intention for people to suffer like that? This is a constant question in, regardless of religion, whether you're Hindu or Islam, uh, Muslim or um, Christian, Jew, Jewish, whatever it is. And the answer to that question is, well, it's God's will that the planet have a, a, a um, central coolant system, plate tectonics, right, that shift and move. And as those plates move, well, there are earthquakes, but there's also a release of pressure that causes survivability, sustainability of life on the planet. If you believe in the divine, then you also believe in that sort of shifting sort of model, this natural theology. The circumstantial will of God is, well, there's collateral damage due to that central coolant system. So that's a really, really interesting piece there. But what is the third piece? There's the intention of God, the circumstantial will of God, and then ultimately there is the ultimate will of God. Leslie Weatherhead in this a brief essay and book, really, that he wrote, it's like three or four essays that were put into a book. You can buy it on Amazon for like five bucks. Um, I think it's a really, really insightful piece. The ultimate will of God talks about the idea that in the end, God's will is done. What's happening here in chapter 17 is the idea that there is an intentional will of God, but what happens when something begins to thwart the will of the life stream? How do you bring about that ultimate will of the life stream when something like Sephiroth or Shinra subverts it? It's a really fascinating question with lots of implications for us. Predestination doesn't necessarily mean that everything is set in stone and that people don't have free will and agency. What it means is that God's foreknowledge applies to every potential outcome and bracket. So here, Aerith and Sephiroth know the will of the planet with foreknowledge. What do they do with it? And that's kind of the question. Yeah. This brings the events of chapter 18 in perspective. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely it does. This is the core of this game. I think it's why the producers of this game and the directors of this game specifically cited predestination in one of the recent interviews. So, um, this is a really, really fascinating concept. Um, I'm sorry if I was a little long-winded about that, but I, I hope that it was helpful. Um, to, to the understanding of this game and maybe even the understanding of religious philosophy in that respect. This is something that I try to teach in my classes. Um, but if you want to know more, then um, yeah, this should go on YouTube. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll plug that on YouTube.